hope I don't lose my place. Connor said I got enough for 13 lessons, or I told her that. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight, and uh, uh, thank you all for letting me talk to you guys tonight. This little bat right here, it's got something significant to a broomstick that Doug used when he was growing up, and that'll come up a little bit later, later in the lesson right here. It's a little baseball bat. It's not very big. I'll try to hurry and get through this. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to look out and see you guys here at Carbondale tonight. And uh, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about my early life and a little bit about my Army. 49th, 41st, uh, was there a lady down there preaching at, at 41st? OK, that's the one I, that married me and Connor. OK, I was born. Tahlequah, Oklahoma, uh, August the 2nd, 1943. And you know that God has blessed my life beyond measure. I, I can't think of how anyone could be as blessed as much as I've been blessed. Uh, I was uh, supposedly born dead, so they put me in a little basket and set me out on a porch. It was an old country house. And the doctor was still in there with my mom. And the nurse came in a little bit late and said, what's that baby doing out there? He said, well, we put him out there for the funeral home, come by and pick him up. And she said, well, he's alive. So anyway, I had a second chance at life. And I've had a lot of second chances since then. I was raised in Welling, Oklahoma, in a little schoolhouse, first through the eighth grade. We didn't even have water in that schoolhouse. We had a hydrant outside. You had to go get a drink. And the first through the fourth grade, we had a, a Cecil Robertson and his wife. He, they were Baptists. Uh, she taught the first through the fourth grade, and he taught the fifth through the eighth. And uh, we was lucky to have them, I guess, because we had to say a Bible verse every morning when you come to school. You, First thing you did, you had to remember a Bible verse. And uh, sometime they assigned you one. If you said Jesus wept, everybody said that a lot, you know, because that was, if you didn't remember it, you could say Jesus wept. But if you did that, he would assign you three or four Bible verses that week. It's pretty hard. So you had to remember them. So that was a good thing down there. And everybody was uh, had a Baptist church there that he preached at. And, most everybody went there. We were closed on Sundays. Everything was closed around there, so the farmers and everything went down there to church. And uh, I was raised with my mom, and my dad died when I was about six years old. And uh, my mom and them struggled a little bit there about when I was between my sixth and seventh grade. So I had to walk to school about a mile and a half, but I had to get up in the morning and... Uh, Slop the hogs, you know, milk the cows and feed the chickens and do my chores around the house before I went to school because school didn't start till 9 o'clock, 9 to 4. And after school was over, you had to come in and, and chop wood and do the things that your dad and them was supposed to do. But we went ahead and I went ahead and did that. And sometimes I'd forget, and if it was in the wintertime and the stove ran out of wood, boy, you'd have to get out there and saw that wood up anyway. And uh, so my mom met... Uh, Carl Brock, my stepdad, and, and they wanted to move to Tulsa. He, he got a job up here at Flint Steel. So I didn't want to come. I didn't want to come to Tulsa. I, was, I lived out in the woods myself mostly. That's where I stayed my whole life, out in the woods hunting, fishing, and doing things like that. So they made arrangements that I could stay with my grandpa and my uncle. And uh, so I stayed with them one year. I was kind of raising myself. Boy, boy, could get in a lot of trouble with that. I kind of raised myself a little bit there because I'm going to tell you, I was raised, I had a grandfather that was a drunk. He drank every weekend. And I had an uncle. I had three uncles. They were all drunks. My grandpa died up against a tree drunk. And, and uh, I never did drink. I got away from it. 
and I, I didn't chew or smoke either because one time they was cutting wood up there and, and cutting a lot of wood for to sell a little bit and it made me go up there and throw the brush piles. I had to drag all the brush pile them up. So they was all chewing tobacco, so I thought I'd sneak off and go down there and get me a big old chew tobacco. So I went down there and got me some of that cotton bowl, and boy, I was walking on tall cotton. I got about three blocks in the house. I swallowed that, and I got so sick. They, about four or five hours later, they found me laying in the trail, and they had to bring me back to the house, and they didn't chew either. And uh, so I learned some lessons in life a little bit. I could have went the other way, you know, but I didn't because I saw what was happening to everyone. And we lived in an old log house after my father died, and uh, the concrete had fit, fell out of a lot of it. So you had to get newspaper or old rags that you could find stuff in the, there to keep the cold out. Two rooms were had wood floors, and the room I stayed in had dirt floors. So, and uh, try to do the best you can. We didn't have a lot of money like when Jim was raised. Uh, we just did the best we could back in the woods, you know, and, and uh, around Christmas time, we didn't have any money to buy gifts, so uh, they had a, at Thanksgiving, they had a uh, get together at school and they'd, they'd sell pies and cakes, pie suppers, you know, they'd have, and, and they'd raise that money for the kids. And so you'd have a little, little basket full of candy or oranges and apples and little, maybe a little toy in it, but that's all you'd get for Christmas. One year, my aunt brought me underwear, and I'd been going town when I was little watching those westerns for a nickel and coming back, and I wanted to bring me a toy or something. She brought me underwear. Man, I was so mad. I ran off into the woods and hid and wouldn't talk to her, you know, for a while. And later on in life, when you look back on it, that's what you needed, or that's what I needed. And uh, you just allowed one pair of shoes a year, and uh, we spent our time on Barren Fork down there. All the summers, all the kids would go to Barren Fork, spend the whole summers either at the scout hole, the point, and, uh, or the seller's hole. And we've been going back down there for 60 years or more. And Mary and, and Eric, even when they go to Burnt Cabin, they kind of, sometimes they'll go by there, by the creek. It's a pretty place down there, and uh, it's really nice. It's a little bit warmer in the Blue Hole but it, it's really a nice place, and, and uh, it, we didn't appreciate it like you do now when you look back on what you had, you know. And, uh, but I had to work. I wanted to, a little 22, and I was about 10 years old, and you had to work for it, so I had to, I had to go up and pick strawberries when they were in season. You picked them for six cents a quart and, and uh, made a little money and set it back. And you had to pick beans and uh, uh, poke salad. I'd pick poke salad, a toe sack full of poke salad, and walk it four miles out to boot knots, you know, to sell it for 50 cents. And I was able to raise enough $12 to buy a little single shot 22. And my uncle and them buy the shells, but they'd only, when you're hunting, if you went squirrel hunting, they'd only give you five shells. And you better come back with five squirrels or or something, you couldn't waste your ammo. So they, uh, we did a lot down there. And uh, after that, uh, raised with them, an Indian woman raised me. I was raised by a lot of N Native Americans. Uh, her name was Josie Nofar, and she lived further from school, about three miles. So you had to walk to school. And, uh, or you could catch a milk truck of a morning when it come by at six o'clock in the morning, but school didn't start till nine. So we spent a lot of time walking. And uh, that's kind of the way I lived down there. I lived poor, different families kind of raised me down there till I, I made it through the eighth grade down there. And uh, our school teacher put us in, we played ball. You couldn't recess, the boys couldn't go out and do anything, you had to play ball. It was either softball, basketball, or whatever, and the basketball courts were rocks. We didn't have a smooth dirt basketball. You'd be bouncing it, and it might go that way or this way, you know, or whatever. But anyway, he kept us, he kept us going and get us in tournaments, and, and we won about everything around. Went to Oklahoma City, 
in a basketball tournament in eighth grade and they weighed you. You couldn't weigh over 500 and some pounds for, for all of you, for five. If you weighed one pound over that, you had to take a player off and put another one in there. So we won that tournament by one point, came back. And uh, I didn't know what the big cities was. Muskogee was the biggest one I've been to. We went to the fair. I raised 95 cents to go to the fair. And I went over there and I spent my money in about an hour. And, and the bus took us over there from 10 to 3 and then I had to go back and sit by the bus all day long because I was out of money. I didn't know what to do. Another thing we did, my, my grandmother and them, I would go out and hunt raccoons, raccoons and uh, squirrels and possums and different things and we'd skin their hides and I'd tan them on a, the smokehouse for 30 days and then I'd take them to the produce out there at Tahlequah and sell them. They'd give you about 10, 15 cents for each one. It wasn't very much. So that didn't pan out too good. Okay. And then I moved to Tulsa, which I didn't really want to do, and went to a little Baptist church over there, Indian Fellowship Mission at uh, Oakhurst. Don knows where that's at, I guess. And uh, they started playing ball, and I liked that. But they had a rule over there. You had to go to church once a week to be able to play ball. If you didn't go, you didn't play that week. So I thought that's a pretty good rule. I thought we ought to have that here myself. But. Uh, and they had a lot of fellowship dinners, and I was doing pretty good over there, but uh, just to give you an example of studying God's Word, I didn't do that too good, I don't think, because one morning they asked who wanted to be baptized, so three of us raised our hands, and we went up front, and then they asked, does anybody, you know, have any reason why they shouldn't be baptized? So we stood up there in front of the congregation, and about six weeks later, they took us somewhere and baptized us. I forgot where we went. But anyway, I started playing ball with the Jerry Tiger. And Tom Tiger had a girls team. And Jerry said, well, you ought to go over there. And it's about six and a half miles to where the ballpark was. So I had to walk. We didn't have a car. He said, there's a pretty good girl, pretty girl down there in pigtails. And I told you that. So I went down there, and uh, maybe I, that was uh, how I met Connor. And after that, that's probably one of the greatest gifts that God allowed me to have. Uh, I wound up with Sean and Hunter and Stone and Doug come along, and and. Uh, so we got married January the 9th, 1964, by Darrell Lady. He come to Jim Johnson's house, and we got married over there. I didn't want to go to a big church. I was kind of bashful, you know, so I didn't, didn't want to go. So we got married, and we worked about a year, and we just bought a new car, and everything was kind of going good. And all of a sudden, I got a letter in the mail, a draft notice, to report down there at Oklahoma City to Robertson. And we wasn't too happy about that, you know. Uh, I tried everything in the way, way in the world to get out of it, but I, but I couldn't. And uh, I even tried to go to college, you know, entered, and it still didn't do me any good. I didn't get, to, didn't get to go. They drafted me. Well, that turned out to be one of the greatest blessings in my life. Uh, here's one thing they told me. Told you what to bring. Don't bring a whole lot because you're just going to have to send it home or throw it away. Don't bring any, just one pair of underwear and all of that, you know. So I did. I, I went by the rules. Well, it didn't send us to Fort Hood, Texas, where we were supposed to go. They sent us to Fort Bliss at El Paso because they hadn't rotated out yet. There's a two-week deal on not rotating us out. So I wound up having to wash my underwear every night for two, for two weeks. For two weeks, and everybody else brought some more of theirs. So I washed mine out. And uh, anyway, we got to Fort Hood, Texas, and started basic training, and we'd write Connor, and it, we couldn't hardly call her. They wouldn't hardly let you call in the first two or three weeks of basic. And uh, went through th three weeks of training. When we first got in there, went through three weeks of training, of testing. They tested you for a full three weeks on uh, 
everything, math, science, you know, English, everything, it tested you on common sense things. And the uh, guy told me, he said, go through there real fast and answer the ones you can, and then go through it again and, and use some common sense on some of them. If you can't, can't get it down, don't skip it, just check B on the four multiple questions, A, B, C, and D, you know. So I did that, I, I did that. Three weeks later, uh, I got called to the commander's office and said, uh, you qualified the highest down here that we've had. You had IQ of 47 and, and, and uh, of all the people and uh, we're gonna send you to West Point. And I just got married, you know, and, and me and Connor didn't even hardly have time to think about it. So we thought, well, that'd be eight more years or eight years. That's probably a, probably should have went to school there, but I didn't. I went back and told him, well, I didn't want to do that. So we skipped that. So I had the, at least I had the opportunity to go there. So we, I've made some wrong decisions in my life, you know, about things. And uh, so I, I talked to Connor and we decided two years for eight years, you know, and, and we, we didn't do that. So I started base, basic. And about two weeks after we started that basic, all these guys down there around us, the other people were getting cookies. The moms and wives and them was mailing them cookies every day. So we told Connor and Evelyn Dotson, the one you prayed for, her and Connor worked together. So they got together and made us a batch of cookies and sent them down there. And boy, we were so proud of that. We, we didn't want to share them because if you shared them with 40 people, They'd be gone like that, you know. So we hid them under the barracks. So they turned green after, after, after a couple days, they turned green. Finally, we, got, we even eat them with green cookies, so we ate them. And uh, we had a, got through, about halfway through basic, and they started to give you a leave. Uh, just on Saturday and Sunday, you could get a, a leave, but you couldn't go over 75 miles. So... We didn't have a car or anything to get home, so me and Leon, we caught a, there was a lady down there that you could park your car there at, at one of the guys that we knew, so I come home to get our car, so we, we went to the airport and we couldn't get a flight, but, but there was an army transport going out that was flying up here, so we got on that thing in the tail end of it and it flopped like that all the way home. We flew in some storms and Connor and Evelyn thought a plane went down. You know, they, they thought it was us, so we was lucky. We lucked out of that, so, uh, man, God God was with me. I mean, God took care of me, and I don't know why some of the times, all through my life. Anyway, made it home, I got my car, took off down there, and the next weekend, we got another two-day pass, and it's about a six-and-a-half-hour drive home, and when, sometimes we only had five or six hours here and had to go back, so we'd come home, and it's a pretty new Malibu, 64 Malibu. So one time we was coming through Dallas, Texas, probably about 80 mile an hour, but that wasn't a half of it. Anyway, we, they was driving about 70 mile an hour then. I know when you go down there. So we, we come through there, and I guess a cop got after us. We didn't see him. He chased us all the way to Denton, Texas, and uh, probably going 90, 90 to 100 sometime trying to get home. And he, he stopped us. He said, I can't even give y'all a ticket. I can't explain how I chased y'all 30-some miles. He said, I'm going to take you down here to this judge at this court, and you're going to have to explain to them. So he took us down there, and they called a judge, and here's the one-armed judge, and we knew he was in trouble. So he said, how much money you guys got? He knew we couldn't get an Article 15 because it was already past our mileage and everything. If we did, we'd be in the stockade when we went back. So we scrounged up $54 and he said, I'll take it. So he took it and let us go. So, but we lucked out on that. And I come home and we about got through basic and we did that and I was bringing people home with me all the time and they, and they only had so much, so much time to meet me to go back. There's a guy named Bendabout and he didn't show up a couple of times. So he wound up in the stockade down there and he didn't he didn't get to go with us at times, and, and he had stayed it mostly most of his time in the stockade. 
And now he lived at Locust Grove, and now he's a preacher down there. And uh, so it got time to, at the end of the basic, they separated us up. We all trained kind of. To, we went to AIT to go to Vietnam. And uh, half, of them, half of them stayed there, and another half got separated in another place, and we were sent to Germany. So I went to Germany, and we were going to train over there. I was assigned to a, it, was a, it was a bad unit. It was a 1st 87th Airborne Ranger unit, and they were tough. And we landed there at Frankfurt Airport, and they hauled us over there to our barracks, and we thought, we're going to get some rest. Old sergeant got out there, and he says, throw your stuff down, your duffel bag and everything down. We're going to run here a little bit. We thought, well, we could outrun that, that dude. He's older than all of us. He took us off down a mountain, across some water, and we looked like we'd come out of a sewer by the time we'd come back, and, and it was bad. I mean, he, he, he was in shape, and we wasn't. And... Uh, Anyway, I got in that unit, and uh, Connor told me, first thing, they said they're going to start letting the wives come over if you're first class PFC, and I wasn't a PFC yet, so I tried hard and got that. She said to go down and check and see when, where the Church of Christ is. So I went down to the chapel and talked to the chaplain. He was down there, and he, he, had, he had everybody else, you know, Methodist, uh, Presbyterian, the Baptists, and everybody else, Catholic, he knew where they all met, but he didn't know where the Church of Christ. He said, I think they're meeting in a farmhouse about eight miles outside of town. So I went down there, and I, I did my best. I wasn't a Christian yet because Connor kept on and on me all the time. One of my hang-ups was music, and another one was a few more things. So I, I studied and studied and studied. I was kind of relieved, you know. I did the best I could. I, I didn't find it. So I called her, told her I didn't find it. And uh, so anyway, we got up, applied for housing and, and got accepted, and she got to come to Germany. Well, has anybody heard of push ball? It's worse than football. It's, they got a ball about eight foot around, and you got to push it that 100 yards on that football field. The only thing is you don't have any any shoulder pads, any knee pads, any helmets, everything's legal. You can grab that guy by the neck, throw him aside, kick him or whatever, you can do that. And we were playing for the use of a championship over there of, of the Seventh Army. And I don't know why they picked me to go down there, but that general did. And I went down there and, and supposed to met Connor in about 15 hours at the Frankfurt Airport. So I went down there and played and they won that. And I had a black eye, a busted lip, bloody nose, and my arms was all tore up and everything. And I was in bad shape. And I got to Frankfurt. You catch it. I caught a train down there to get her. And I got to Frankfurt and got over to the airport. And I slept on the bench until she come in. She come in, and I was hurting. And she looked at me like I'd been in a, attacked in an alley by two or three people. But you know, all the hurt and pain went away when I saw her. So we went on to, to the barracks and got situated. And soon as we did, there was a little track on the door, Church of Christ. And it had a little phone number on it where you could call it. It was on every door. So they were out working. And uh, so I called it and I told them we didn't have a way uh, to get to church, and he said, we'll come by and get you, but one thing, you got to be on time. You know, you got to be out there and be ready. So we was ready, and we, we went over there, and uh, that was one of the, probably one of the best experiences that we've ever had in our lifetime, meeting some of the best Christians, I guess, you could ever meet. Uh, Joe Warren, he was, uh, went to White Trey Road, and uh, his son, David, down there now is an elder down at White Ferry Road Church of Christ in Louisiana. And uh, James Hudley, he was on the Freed Hardman Board of Directors. I mean, these were guys 
that just like I was in there, and, and, but the only thing is I was a little peon, they call it, little little private first class, and here they were all, you know, captains and lieutenants and all of that. But it didn't seem to matter at that little church what you were. And uh, Joe and Carla Owen, we met, and Mary Lynn uh, Pollard, and they were from Alabama. And I think the ladies class had a book by their daughter, uh, her name was Pollard, and I forgot her first name. And she wrote a book, and I think the ladies' class have used that book. And uh, we met so many good people over there that uh, they were such, they encouraged me, you know, to they raised you up to another level. Is what they did. Uh, at midnight, midnight sometimes it snowed a lot up there where we was at. We was at the end of the tracks and up in the high mountains. We'd take tubes at midnight, it's like daylight, and go up on, climb those big tubes and slide down them. A l bunch of us in the congregation would. And, and we had a lot of fun doing that. And so the church, I was stuck over there. Well, before that, they were studying with me all the time, and I kept trying to study and study. That's why we need to read our Bibles all the time and to know the truth. And uh, so I decided to become a Christian. We got a baptism, I don't know what it is, 68 degrees? Huh? I don't know what it is. But, but anyway, uh, I got over and decided to be baptized, and it was about 10 or 11 at night. We went over to that old farmhouse, and it was in January, and about probably about 10 degrees. That baptistry was frozen with about three inches of ice. So that would have been a time to back out, I guess, but... Anyway, you know what? You didn't even feel it. You got in there, and they baptized you, and uh, come out okay. And then one day, Connor, a lady asked Connor to babysit her daughter, I mean, her, her, her son. And he said a prayer, and uh, Connor said he didn't finish his prayer. And Connor told him, well, we finish your prayers in Jesus' name, you know, amen. So his mother Talked to Connor later, and the little boy corrected his mom. Said, Mom, we don't say our prayers like that. We uh, say, in Jesus' name, amen. So you don't know whose lives you're going to touch when you're around them and influence that you have on others. But these guys touched our lives so much. We went to, we was able to go to, on a mission trip. It was a workshop, kind of like they had here in Tulsa at Birch's Garden, Germany, one of the prettiest places I've ever seen on earth. And man, it was pretty. We went down there and stayed three or four days at that workshop and was able to go to Austria, over there where the Sound of Music, Salzburg, was filmed and, and toured some of those dungeons they had. And then we went to Garmisch. It was a real good place. It, they, copied that castle that they had over there for Disney World. That's where they got that castle. It was there with that big lake behind it. Beautiful place. And uh, while we were at, uh, at Birch's Garden, though, you, you, you picture in your mind, it was in Bavaria, these little guys running around in little leather suits with their little hats, with a little feather coming out. Well, they did. That's what they went around town. The little girls had their little German dresses on and everything, and Hitler had his hideout up there in, up there in Birch's Garden. It was called the Eagle's Nest. Boy, it's a pretty place. And we went up there and ate, and it was pretty high up, but you could see all the beauty, beautiful things around you. The little, little ladies had all their dresses, and it, it looked like something out of a movie. So we enjoyed that, and we came back, and the... Uh, Joe and them, they decided to get another bus for the church. And they did. They got another bus. And we got a bus. They gave us that bus, me and Connor. So we decided, you know, we wanted to take a trip. So we did. Jane and Bob, and, you know, others, another Christian family took one with us. So we went through Luxembourg and uh, Holland. You know, went to Amsterdam. And in Holland, it was kind of a camp out thing. We camped out. <laughs> well... The bumblebees got us in Holland, 
and, and stung Connor and Jane, and, and we didn't know if we was going to get out of that, and so we got out of that, finally got to England. When we was in England, we got to see a lot of things over in England, you know, the Piccadilly Circus, the Tower Big Ben, and the, and the river, and all that stuff, so we got to see a lot for a little old boy that come out of the country, and, uh, and uh, after, after that, we went, come back to France through Calais, came back, back to France, and we went to Paris. And I got that Eiffel Tower, and it's a lot taller than what you think. I mean, what you see in movies, it's way up there. Well, Connor went up to the second floor. She said, I'm not going any further. So I went on up, and boy, you could see beautiful gardens. I mean, it, it, it was pretty, so we got to see that, or I did, and then we went to the Palace of Versailles, and Napoleon Bonaparte was their big old hero in France. They had it fixed to where you could uh, view his tomb, but it went up and you had to kneel down to pay him tribute to see his tomb. You know, they fixed it that, that way where you paid him respect and Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, so we got to do that. And uh, Let's see, we got in France and Paris, got to see all of that. We went through Belgium, too, and uh, London. We got, we got to see the Queen's Palace. We didn't get to go in. We got the little guard standing there, statue, just stiff as a board. And you, you get right up against them, they wouldn't even blink an eye. I don't know how they did that. They just looked, I don't, I don't know, I guess they were trained to do that. And uh, so uh, we got to see a lot of things. So. And when we got back, we decided, well, we wanted to go some other countries. So we, we, we got on a tour bus. And uh, when we did, we went down through Italy. And we got to see an awful lot in Italy. Uh, Milan, Milan, Italy is where they got all the, it's, it's a graveyard, but it's, boy, they got statues you wouldn't believe over there. Got to see the Leaning Tower Pizza. Got to, went to Florence, Italy, where they got the, the Last Supper. Big mural up on the wall, Last Supper. And I had a restaurant there that I got kicked out of on, almost. They had some tri tripe. I didn't know what tripe was at that time, and I made fun of it, and they wasn't supposed to do that. And uh, so anyway, we wound up at Rome and we got to see the catacombs, you know, where the Christians were persecuted and, and, and they had little, all little rooms all around. We got to see the catacombs, the Trevia Fountain, the Appian Way where the soldiers marched and all of that. And when you go to Rome and you got statues of Moses, he's got horns. Oh, man, I got to hurry. I'm, I'm a, it's almost 7 o'clock. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of skip some of this. You went to Rome and you go to Venice and uh, lots of castles. We got to see St. Peter, the Vatican over there, and they had a statue of Peter. The, the priest wasn't there that day, or the Pope, but when you walk in, it had a statue of Peter, and half his foot was gone where everybody kissed it or, or walked on it. So anyway, we got to do all of that, and I'll hurry here. Got a on a vacation, I'm gonna tell you a couple of little vacations. Went to Tennessee on a vacation, and, and, and Sean and Connor, they went down there to take a shower, and pretty soon I heard some singing. Man, they were singing, just a swinging, by Jerry Anderson or whatever it is, that John Anderson. They were singing, and I went down there and looked at all those women looking and the clapping, you know. So they were, they were singing that song. And went to Nashville, camp, camped out. These are camp outs that we took. Went to Nashville and camped out. We put a little tent up, had a bag of clothes, and I set it outside. I got up the next morning, got to looking. Man, there's a bunch of clothes strung out down through this trail, you know. And, and it coons, the coons had come up and scattered it all over the place. Well, I thought it was somebody else's and got to looking, that was Connor's and mine. So I had to go pick all that up. And I had an old truck that we went on another trip. And I knew it was using oil here. So we went to Wyoming and, and, and you know, all up through there. 
<laughs> I bought a case of oil and put, put one quart in there and I didn't even get to Kansas and I checked it and it dry. Put two quarts in it and drove about 100 miles when I got to Ogallala, Nebraska. I'd used half of it and I had to buy two cases of oil for that pickup. I should have taken it to Roger's house and had that fixed before that. And uh, I'll have to skip my ball plan. I went to, Sean wanted me to play ball one time, coach a girls team. I went out there, coached that girls team. Man, you don't treat girls like you do boys. You gotta, you gotta know how to treat them, you know. They each, each got different ways. Can't just holler at them like you do boys. We got beat 15 to three that night. They were called the bananas beat us. No one ever beat us again after that. So I got with them and they won a lot of ball games, over 1,200 trophies. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about 41st. Uh, first time, Connor wanted me to go to church at the 41st Street Church of Christ. And, and I just had an old T-shirt, you know, and some jeans. That's what James Dean wore back then, you know. And I thought, boy, that was good. It's a new T-shirt. And they kind of got on to me for the way I dressed. Some of the kids said, we don't, we don't come to church dressed like that. So, I mean, when we look around, somebody comes into ours, we shouldn't say anything about how anybody's dressed because you don't know what's in their heart. And uh, so I didn't want to come back. Kind of kept on me, so I went back. And uh, so we had some... Uh, great men and women, 41st Street kind of moved over there in the school building. They built that building. Man, we had a lot of great men and women over there, and they had a, a lot of influence upon mine and Connor's life when we come back from Germany. They was on mission trips. They were using the Ivan Stewart's program. They were teaching that. Uh, Betty Mathis's husband, uh, you know, they kind of helped teach her, teach him. And uh, Evelyn and, and, and Connor was doing a Bible study with Iron Freda Stanley. Uh, and they were teaching it, and Iyer was kind of blind. They didn't know that. And they got into the stu study, and they said, that's kind of like the blind leading the blind, you know, in that study. But anyway, they were converted. And that's how I spent my time in the service. Leon and Evelyn, as soon as we come back, we invited them to church. They come to church and were baptized and been members ever since. So it's the influence that you have on other people. And uh, they did a lot of Bible studying. And one night, they wanted me and, and Bob Layton Jr. to go to a Bible study. We went down there, and I opened a Bible study with a prayer, ended it in Jesus' name, and he said, that's it, y'all can leave. The Jehovah Witnesses, so we got kicked out because we used Jesus' name at the end of the prayer. And I want to tell one more little thing about 40, 40 night. I had a ball game with Memorial Drive, Terry Rush. Everybody remember Terry Rush? Okay, he kept calling, wanting to play fast pitch softball. They were so good. Well, we just had seven guys. We had to use Jim Clary's two daughters to play. We went over to play him. Man, we smoked him. Because all of our guys had been playing fast pitch except those two girls. And those two girls did great. And, uh, boy, he got some mad. Christian's not supposed to do that, you know. He got mad because we beat him with some girls. <laughs> but Connor worked for him over there. He was a good guy, good preacher. And uh, 49th had a lot of camp, a lot of good, good camp outs. Lucian was there. I Man, we had the Teagues. Connor got pregnant in there with Sean. And, and uh, they laid me off. And Larry Teague came up and said, well, I know where we can go pick up some pecans. So he knew a guy up, up above uh, Owasso and somewhere up in there, and we went up there, and he knew the shaker, put down a uh, visqueen down there in the ground, and we took home about 50 pounds a day, and I was able to sell those pecans for a while till I got a job, another job, and uh, worked out there at North American Rockwell. And I was, uh, yeah, out there. And uh, I tested their equipment for them. And, and, and when they drill the rivet holes, you had to undo some of them because they'd be watered out. Some of that went to the spaceship and worked on the bulkheads inspector out there on the 747s. And uh, then right after that, come to Carbondale. I'm about to get this over. I had to skip 12 pages. <laughs> anyway, anyway, 
we come to Carbondale. I wasn't in the movement when Don and, and a bunch of them was over there in Lucian and, and, and uh, got down to where we kind of separated and they moved over here to Carbondale and Lucian took over Sperry and some of them went to different places. But anyway, I, I was working down at Oklahoma City and wasn't getting hardly any time off and driving back and forth. So Connor did the burden of all of that thing. She took care of everything for me. And we come to Carbondale, man, this was a, another level, kind of like Germany, you know. It was a friendly congregation and, and full of love, and everybody seemed to care about you. You didn't come in here as a stranger. And the hospitality, and they were mission-minded, and uh, went to Tipton's, uh, helped out in prison. Some of the things that we did, maybe some of you don't know, is, is we had a first response team worked with uh, Park Plaza, and it was out of Florida, I think, and they did the Joplin tornado. They got in there quick. They went down and did the Moore tornado, and uh, they did a lot of good mission things we did here of our own. Uh, we took, tried to get the widows to go out to eat dinner with us. It started with about 12, and uh, finally, I think Kathy and Roger's kind of taken over that and doing a great job with that, and we appreciate them. And then they come along. And Roger, and Roger and Kathy come along and blessed us, and they've been teaching our young people ever since, and we appreciate that. If you go ever went to Branson with Helen, Betty Mathis, Linda Hunt, or Donna Francis, Helen, you laughed all the way up there and all the way back. We caught her telling jokes to a hotel we were staying down there where they was eating and had everybody laughing. They said that was better than any of the shows they'd gone to. And there's a lot of great things still going on here at Carbondale. And, uh, boy, I, I left out a lot. Didn't I? Anyway, that's a little bit about my kind of life story. And you can look back over your life. You know, some of the decisions we've made in our lives have been easy ones to make. Some of them hadn't, hadn't been as easy. And uh, some have been right, some have been wrong. But it's... Uh, and it hadn't, hadn't always been the easiest way. The choices we make in life means a lot to, to how we live our lives. Uh, there's a good article in today's paper about Alan Trimble and some of his players and how much he loved God. Uh, Tom Brady, Connor didn't want me to talk about sports, Won the Super Bowl last year. Nobody gave him a chance. Nobody. He was favored to get beaten three of the games they played in. But they were heavy favorite. They were heavy favorites to get beat. But nobody picked Tampa Bay to win. And players weren't even on the same team when Tom went to Tampa to play with Brady. And that Bryce that Owens, Bruce Owens, Aarons, came out of retirement, and he stated that Brady brought everyone around him up to a higher level. He made them a lot better team. The best motivation that anybody had ever seen. He could motivate you, he studied. He knew the offense, he knew the defense of the other teams. He was a role model. And he got the game ball, but he gave it to the other players. He brought unity, and he brought the best out in each player. You know, in our lives, we have to prepare to be ready. If we want to try to do the best that we can in life and live for God, we need to study the way that maybe Tom Brady or some of them studied about these other teams. And if we study the Bible like he studied preparing for a football game, if we want to go to heaven, we're going to have to prepare ourselves. And if we get the chance in our lives, I brought a book to Terry and Don, they're reading it, spread, pray for one. If this year, if we just pray for one person, that can, we can have the opportunity to teach or bring the message of Jesus Christ to just one person. If we could do that, look how 
our congregation could grow a little bit. That one person could maybe help another one. In that book, they said they doubled the congregation in two years, and it was the hardest congregation they could double. I read one story in there. A guy come to church, and it was a good sermon, good lesson. But he left, told a preacher, he'd, or told a guy he'd never be back. He said, well, why? He said, well, I'm unworthy. So he kept walking a little bit, and Matt had that in his lesson this morning about unworthy. He walked a little bit, and the guy hollered at him and said, hey, I'm unworthy. You know, finally they got to talking, and he stayed there and become a Christian, so that was a, that was a good thing. Uh, the star that shines the brightest, you know, over in Philippians, it tells us to shine like stars. It's when you give your, your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. In my life, my Carbondale family here shines the brightest. I had so much to say about you guys, but you're going to, you're going to have to wait a little while. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, man, you guys brought my life up to another level by the love that you have for everybody. And uh, uh, Proverbs 5, 3, 5, and 6, it says, uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Uh, so this is, uh, whoops, that's uh, kind of my story, and if, uh, I'll have to continue that later maybe, but it's time to go, so I appreciate all you coming tonight, and uh, I'm proud to be a member, a part of this congregation, and I think this is probably as close to heaven as we can get in this life just going out and doing it and helping others. And uh, in that book that Scott won, it says Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And that's our primary objective, you know, to go out and what we can to touch somebody else's life and to reach out and teach them a gospel message. If you have any needs or anything, or you need any prayers for the congregation, you got a song? He can sing. Uh, you might just come up or let Matt know as we sing our song. Thank you, guys. Oh, I never did tell him about the bat. <laughs> let me tell you about this bat. This is called the ultimate, this thunder stick, the ultimate training device for improving hand and eye coordination. This is to make you a better ball player. This right here is our ultimate training device as Christians should have for us to give an answer to everyone that asks us for the hope that lies within us. This is it. Not any books you can read or anything like that. It's all right here. So if you need any help, we'll just refer them all to Matt. <laughs>